There is an iconic science fiction TV show that features a time-traveling hero. He goes through time and space, facing and conquering all manner of evil threats to civilizations of all kinds. Often he shows up, a stranger to some, but he shows up in the nick of time, and when folks are not sure who he is, people that are familiar with who he is, say, it's okay. He's the doctor. And sometimes he'll show up, and in the middle of all of their confusion, looking for something good to happen, hoping for something good, they'll say, who are you? And he'll say, I'm the doctor. And for some reason, for him walking on the, on the scene saying, I'm the doctor, everything is supposed to be okay, because he's the doctor. Now, I suppose that either shows you how much of a nerd I am, or at least the nerds that I hang out with that have got me into this a uh, classic television show. The genius behind the BBC classic Doctor Who is that it's all built around a doctor who is supposed to know what to do. The doctor's here. He'll know what to do. It's okay. I'm the doctor. Now, when we think about our passage this morning, Jesus has been, and I'm not trying to trivialize this, I'm trying to get us to think about the significance of what Jesus was talking about. We're looking at an introduction of who Jesus is. Our sermon series is entitled, um, learn of me. We want to learn about this servant Savior, Jesus Christ. And he has started his ministry and he's been healing and been doing some other things and he's introducing himself uh, in different roles. But today he talks about himself as the doctor. Now that's an interesting thing. You think about the doctor as healing the sick. But I think it's bigger than uh, an MD, a doctor of medicine. He is the doctor. See, he knows what to do. He knows what you need. And he has the means to give it to you. In our passage today, as we think about the people that need Jesus, it all breaks down to this. It is the sick <coughs> that need a doctor. And guess what? Bless you. The doctor knows what you need, and the doctor knows how to give it to you. Let's think about this for a minute. By the way, just before I uh, go back up there, I found this little meme, and I, and I like it an awful lot. The church isn't a museum for good people. It's a hospital for the broken. Isn't that cool? People say, well, wait a minute. I don't know if I ought to go to church because there's hypocrites there. Don't you think that'd be a good place for a hypocrite to get fixed? Amen? <clears throat> and don't worry, we'll let you in too. <laughs> the 
the sick people need a doctor. Now, the Pharisees, <laughs> they had some things to learn today. See, Jesus, the servant, came to save sinners by knowing exactly what they need and giving it to them and giving them the opportunity to receive it. The first thing that we find is that the ignorant crowds need to be taught. The doctor knows what to do. Mark chapter 2 and verse 13. He went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. I want you to understand something. A lot of times people start to think about, oh, Jesus is the great physician. He is the great physician that healed people. Yes, he healed people, but why did he heal people? Did he heal people just because it made them feel better? No, that was a means to the end because you know what? If all he did was come and heal people and then they died and went to hell anyway, nothing has really been accomplished. See, Jesus came to heal people because he came to preach to people. And he came to preach to people because he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Because he came to die for sinners, and we're all sinners, and we need the gospel. That's why Jesus came. So why did he heal? Why did he cast out demons? Why did he do miracles? So that he could get an audience, so that he could teach people. See, it all came down to that. It all comes down to preaching. It all comes down to getting the message out. Go back to Mark chapter 1 and verse 38, and he starts to explain this to Peter. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next town, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. The reason why I'm here right now is to preach the gospel. Yes, I could sit here in this one town, and I could heal and heal and heal and heal, and I could cast demons out until the cows come home. But listen to me, I've got something bigger than just healing, something bigger than casting demons out. I need to preach. I need to teach. It's an interesting thing. The Bible says that the crowds resorted to him. The multitude resorted unto him. Once he started doing miracles, the word resorted is it made, they made it their habit to follow him. He drew a crowd now. Folks wanted to see what was going on. Folks wanted to see what... Uh, what is up, you know, one of the things, it wasn't just because of the miracles. See, when he taught, he taught with the authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. Oh, folks have heard religious pontification all their life. They were under the slavery of, uh, and the tyranny of the religious elite that would tell the masses how they ought to live. And the Masses were terrified of misstepping because the religious elite had so much power and control over them. But Jesus was now removing that control by removing their ignorance. Wasn't setting himself up as being very popular in the religious crowd. I want you to understand something. As we start thinking about church, we start thinking about outreach, everything comes down to teaching and preaching. You know, we have folks doing church different today. Folks say, well, listen, I've taken a survey, and, and folks that don't go to church, I've underst I understand now that the reason why they don't go to church is people preach too long. If you have a 
lot of music and a little message, you'll get more people to come to church. Maybe that's true. But if you get a whole bunch of people to come to church and you don't do what you're supposed to do, what have you accomplished other than patting your own wallet? So here's the deal. Don't ever let someone talk you out of the primacy of preaching. Different religions do things differently. And, you know, I'll just tell you, it is the crescendo of the service, of the order of the service, you see what is central. There are religions that they will have a time of singing, time of scripture reading, offering, all those other things, but the end, the most holy part is the taking of communion every time because they believe that this is the impartation of grace. This host becomes actually Jesus Christ and I take literally Jesus Christ into my body. That is so holy. That is the pinnacle of the service. And that's where, what folks believe. And you know what? You can tell it by the way that they do church, right? Now, in a Baptist church and, and other evangelical churches, the pinnacle is every week we finish with preaching. Now, sometimes we have communion after, but every week it's preaching. This is the main thing that we're here for. Keep your finger here and flip over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, you think about this. You say, isn't there another way we could do this? What about, we could, ha we could just have musicals or, or uh, cantatas all the time, because that would be more fun. Uh, what about, what if we would have drama? Uh, let's see, we have too much church and drama in church, amen. Uh, <laughs> No, but what if we had drama for the presentation? I think that'd be more effective than this old-fashioned, worn-out thing we call preaching, where some guy gets up and talks for a while, and sometimes he yells at us and stomps his feet and creates a big ruckus. You know what? I mean, that, that's an old-fashioned way to do it. Let's come up with a new idea. We've got to come up with something new, because, you know, we're in 2015. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God, here it is, by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. There are folks that are more intellectual than all of us, and they'll come and they'll say, it's foolish to keep doing this same old thing, to get up here and to preach the gospel and, <coughs> and to teach and to do like Jesus did, and preach with authority. Thus saith the Lord, hey, how do you know? what Your truth is maybe not be my truth. No, the truth is the truth whether we get it or not. You know what? Jesus knew what folks needed. Why? Because he's the doctor. And he showed up and he said, you know what? Well, I've got crowds coming. These crowds don't know the truth. They need to know the truth. Therefore, they need to be taught. No, they need to be healed. I'll heal them to draw the crowd, but they need to be taught. 
Listen, they might not keep coming if you're not entertaining. Maybe you ought to teach Peter how to sing. Hey, listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, what they need is they need to be taught. How do you know? Because you're the doctor. Never despise the primacy of preaching. Understand that you have the privilege of hearing preaching. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You say, how can people get saved without faith? They can't get saved without faith, but the only way to get faith is by hearing the word of God. That happens in church. That happens when you teach and preach the truth in your life. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Get all that you can learn. Get all the preaching that you can, because that's what the doctor ordered. Next. The lost soul needs a new path. Back to Mark chapter 2. Look at verse 14. It came, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of, the, of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. He arose and followed him. Levi, surnamed Matthew, the tax collector. Now, He wasn't just a he wasn't just a government worker. This was someone who made his profit by extortion. He sat at the receipt of the custom, which meant he was at he was in charge of tolls. You can't pass by here unless you pay me for the road. Now, the more he would, now, they didn't just have a set fee. He was basically paid on commission. Whatever he could extort from them out of fear and intimidation, that's how he got his money. He was not looked on as a nice guy. Now, something I learned in preparation this time that I hadn't known before, Jewish culture had something. When a Jew would enter into the customs service, he was disqualified from ever serving in a Jewish courtroom. He could never render a judgment over somebody else, and he could never serve as a, a witness in court for or against someone because he was immediately disqualified as not having the character to be able to be trusted in the court of law. Jews were pretty smart back then. Don't trust a tax collector, huh? But the point is, Levi was an outcast. No one wanted to have anything to do with him. What would make someone choose a profession like this? What would make someone allow himself to be such a pariah in society where people would see a tax collector and close their doors and windows, where people would see a tax collector and walk on the other side of the street, where people see a tax collector who, um, come into, uh, into a, a, a restaurant and people would leave the table and go somewhere else. Why in the world would you choose a profession like that? You know why? Because you got a lot of money. 
So Levi, he had a sin problem. He was covetous. He loved money. But guess what? That sin also had an effect. He was a pariah. And you know what? Most folks that are eyeball deep in sin, they kind of hate themselves too. And he was overcome. Folks weren't reaching out to him saying, listen, God can forgive you, although God could, amen. No, people, would, people weren't saying, hey, listen, let's try again, let's get you to repent, let's go to the synagogue together, let's learn some stuff together, let's talk about this. No, people didn't want to have anything to do with him. So he was stuck on his own. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, he didn't hear because nobody wanted anything to do with him. And here comes Jesus. Jesus know who he was? Yep. Jesus know what he did? Hey, listen, Jesus knew more about what Levi did than Levi knew about what Levi did. He called him anyway. See, in the Old Testament, the story of, of salvation, he brought me up out of a horrible pit. Levi was in this horrible pit, in this miry clay, and he couldn't pull himself out. Yet God reached down, got a hold of him, and pulled him out. And you know what? He set my feet upon a rock, and he established my going. He taught him a new path. Jesus offered a new path in spite of his past. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord laid on him, laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus offered something else. He simply said, follow me. What does that mean? Well, if you follow me, you won't be here anymore. If you follow me, you're leaving all this stuff behind. If you follow me, you're leaving that old reputation behind. If you follow me, you leave that a sin of intimidation and covetousness behind. You follow me, I'm going to show you something new. Where are we going? None of your business. Somewhere that's not here. Well, I wonder if it's worth it. It is. How do I know? Trust me. It's interesting. Levi didn't say, huh. I wonder if it's worth it. Let me run the numbers and see if I can expect to make as much as a disciple as I would as an extortioner. Follow me. Okay. And he did. Why? Never discount a man because of his past. When Jesus calls you away from a life of sin and to follow him instead, take the offer. For the lost and wandering, a new path is just what the doctor ordered. Society's rejects need a place of acceptance. I love verse 15 here. It came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many that followed him. Matthew had a house. Levi had a house. Levi got saved. He left everything and followed Jesus. And the first thing he did is say, Hey, everybody, man, I want to celebrate. Everybody come over and eat with me. And so they did. So Jesus' disciples were invited. Jesus was invited. And Matthew wanted to get all of his friends. Now, what kind of people would a low-down, dirty criminal have as friends? <laughs> yeah, so you had a whole house full of low-down, dirty criminals. Now, did Jesus say, well, see, I'm trying to start a new religion here, and it, what, this wouldn't look good if I hung out with you folks. 
He was like, man, this is great. Let's go. The disciples, let's go. Did you understand here? When it's, they said it sat at meat, the way they would do it, the way the custom was, uh, folks would eat reclining. I like that. These guys were like half reclining. And this was a very casual kind of thing. And so we had a house full of folks just kind of kicking back. And socially, what was happening at this point, this is when folks would feel safe to talk about the stuff that's on their mind. See, listen. So the, the thugs, you know, in, in our society, to be the thugs, the gangsters, the drug dealers, the prostitutes, the drug addicts, they're all laying together, lounging back, eating with Jesus, and having a conversation. Now folks would say, listen, you don't get that comfortable around those kinds of folks. Hey, the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Jesus was winning souls. He was allowing them to come, have a place where they could actually talk and, and think through the stuff that he had to say. Why? Because a safe place for, the, for society's rejects? That's exactly what the doctor ordered. Hey, listen to me. The church is doing what it's supposed to do. Now, that doesn't mean, Jesus didn't say, hey, I want you to understand, guys, I don't care if you're thugs. If that's what you choose to do, everybody has their own path. That's cool. Jesus didn't do that. When Jesus came to somebody like that, he would say, no, I forgive you, go and sin no more. Amen? Just because he reached out to them didn't mean he was accepting or condoning their lifestyle. He confronted their lifestyle over and over. But I'm telling you, if there were folks there, and, and let's go ahead, let's just, let's just say it. There were folks there that were society's rejects. So you have the prostitutes. You have the sexually deviant. You have the homosexual folks. You have the addicts. You have all these folks that were just messed up and in your face messed up. And Matthew, our Levi, was tied in with all these folks and he had a house full and Jesus and his disciples hung out with him and talked to him. It was a safe place. Now the next thing, because that's what the doctor ordered. I, I think that um, folks that are not believers need to be able to have a conversation with you without you slapping them in the head with a great big 20 pound King James Bible. Now listen, I have a 20 pound King James Bible or something like that. But listen, you reach them and you, what does the Bible say? Come now, let us what together? Oh, imagine that. Reason and Baptist going in the same sentence. So, that's what the doctor ordered. But how about this? The sick need a doctor. The self-righteous, they'll come and they'll condemn. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he ate with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? What a bunch of riffraff! Jesus said something really powerful. He said, you know what? The righteous don't need a doctor. It's the sick. The sick need a doctor. Righteous, they don't need to repent. Now, was he saying you guys are righteous, therefore you don't need to repent? No, he's saying you guys think you're better than them. Therefore, you're not going to repent. Until you realize that you are like them, 
you'll never have hope. See, if we've been saved for a while, sometimes we get that idea to say, well, I've never been like that. You look at somebody who's wearing their sin out on their sleeves, say, I thank God, I've never done that. Sound like that Pharisee. The Bible says, saw a sinner in the temple and he prays, the Bible says he prays within himself, meaning God wasn't really hearing any of it. Lord, I think you are not like that guy. I fast and I pray and I'm so cool, but I'm not like him and I appreciate that about me. And the other fella fell on his face, crying out loud, beating on his chest, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Who walked out of there saved? The guy who saw who he really was. Here's the deal. If you're in this Christmas season, you say, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty religious and I'm pretty okay. And you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you say, you know, I've been baptized and I've done this and I've done that, so I'm okay. Then you're really mistaken because you're not. Jesus knows what we need. He knows that we need to be preached to. He knows that some of us need to be humbled. Amen. And he knows that the sick need a doctor. Amen. 